Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, I hit the road to visit my friends at Moya Fine Jewelers to take part in our first collaborative watch event. I also experienced some super cool watches and even a mini review of Accutron's latest, the re-release of the legendary astronaut. Just arrived. I probably look absolutely, <laughs> absolutely exhausted. Uh, the hotel is very, very nice. Nike fleece techs, new Vapor Maxes, most comfortable way to fly. I got this um, Stone Island vest because you can put documents, wallets, everything. It's, and when you go through security, you just unzip it, put it in the tray. And there's no, nothing in your pocket, so you just go straight through. It's rarely effective. This place is rather smart, so I'm going to uh, change into more formal attire. Uh, never travel without the GMT. Wait, is that some... Oh, some Pinot Noir. Hello. I have a chandelier. Hugo would like this. <laughs> I'm also wearing the GMT for another reason, because it's kind of related to one of the watches that I've borrowed. Yeah, I look pretty exhausted. I look pretty exhausted. It's a good flight though. Check out the Vapor Maxes. So comfortable. A few years ago, I would have been over the moon, pun not intended, about this release. As you guys know, I am a massive fan of the Accutron Space View for almost 10 years now, in fact. To me, the Astronaut is the brand's second most iconic watch after the Space View, so you can begin to see why this 2023 reissue is kind of a big deal. So I'm already going into it with very high expectations, but more on that in just a moment. So why is the Astronaut so special? Well, think back to a pre-Quartz watch age when Boulevard or Bolova's Accutron ruled supreme with their tuning fork-based electromagnetic movements. The unprecedented accuracy of this cutting-edge tech for the time was unrivaled, and was critical being utilized in the timekeeping that ultimately allowed mankind to put men on the moon. We also mustn't forget, this is way before contemporary computing as well. While the space view was something of a pop culture phenomenon, with its futuristic transparent dial that still looks very much from the future to this day, and inspired so much of Horturology's offerings, the astronaut was its more grown up, there to do business, tooltastic GMT variation. Right, I've uh, spruced myself up. Chelsea boots are on. The turtleneck, of course. Signature of the Urban Gentry for about 10 years now. I think I'm the only one on YouTube that likes turtlenecks, but oh well. I've gone for the Universal Genève uh, for a dress watch. That little pop of white. I've kept it on the original strap. It's just so luxurious. Loving the slenderness, the Gerald Genta classic. His most underrated watch without a shadow of a doubt. So slender because the uh, the micro rotor movement of course i don't know if it's it's not focusing but oh well martini time martinis and steak the astronaut first orbited the earth when it was issued to mercury atlas 9 pilot gordo cooper jr in 1968 while also being given to cia pilots who flew the lockheed a12 reconnaissance aircraft this was of course the height of the cold war period the 2023 release is the T model from 1968 and is at first glance almost indistinguishable from the originals. However, having seen various vintage models during the video tour of their amazing private Boulevard Museum inside the Empire State Building, do check out that episode if you missed it, this time we get a more contemporary 41mm diameter over the 38 of the 60s original. I think we are, we're live. Okay, let's try and make the most of this. The camera right now is balancing precariously <laughs> on a uh, 
uh, an ironing board. I'm here visiting Moya, hosting an event here, which I made the announcement a few weeks ago, well, actually a month ago now. So what watches did I bring with me? Well, I'll start with a wristwatch check. This, which has been lent in very kindly by Accutron. This is the new astronaut. And this is not only any old astronaut, this is number 000. This is actually the one you'll see in all the press photography. So they very kindly lent this sample in. So it is a little bit worn, obviously it's been around all the publications and other vlogs and stuff. I presume so anyway. As you guys know, I'm a massive fan of uh, Accutron and the astronaut and I've been waiting for this re-release. So we'll get into that. And in terms of what I brought, well, it's got to do with this. It's related because I think what I've brought really demonstrates my tastes and my collecting and how it's evolving. There's of course my traveling watch, Pepsi GMT there, which I haven't worn for absolutely donkeys because, well, to be honest, most of my Rolexes, they kind of sit in the safety deposit box in the bank vault because, um, well, you know, the value of them is ridiculous and I just don't feel uh, inclined to wear them out and about. Um, as much as I used to. Uh, and another reason is because watches like the Panerai and another recent acquisition, the Universal Genève White Shadow there, I wore this last night, the thinnest automatic movement for about 25 years. I'd, I've done a whole video all about this Gerald Genta designed classic, highly overlooked, an amazing watch. And I never thought I'd enjoy an oval shaped time only dress watch, but I'm loving it. Um, definitely the most comfortable watch I've ever owned. Other tried and uh, tested classics but very much like the other watches. I used to think that the uh, Mission Impossible Casio here, the DW290 was absolutely fugly uh, but then of course I reviewed one, bought it, now I own about four of them. <laughs> I'm stockpiling them because uh, there's a rumor that they're going to be discontinued which kind of makes sense time-wise and it's just a wonderfully functional, amazing, a rich heritage as well and the story behind it, which I explored in the video, of course, in the review. And I can't get enough of this watch. And then uh, what else have we got? The Panerai, I'll come back to in a little bit later on. And last but by no means least, a Squalid is the forged carbon uh, based on the uh, 1521 case. But of course, with this newer material, very, very light and comfortable. I absolutely love it militaristic, unapologetically macho. Moya have recently become ADs for Squalis. So if you live in the vicinity of uh, here in Carmel, you've always wanted to try a Squalis, now you can, you can go in the store. That's my six watches that I've brought with me. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about the astronaut. Obviously, the tuning fork movement died out during the 1970s as quartz technology allowed for the same great accuracy in fact, even better for much less cost and with greater reliability. The new astronaut is powered by Swiss automatic Celita SW330 GMT, which makes sense considering Accutron's inventor Max Hetzel was Swiss originally, and much of the production in the 1960s was in their Geneva factory before closing in 1983. While only a relative handful of watchmakers are capable of servicing vintage Accutron 214 tuning fork movements, trust me this is a big problem with my own vintage space view, the complete opposite can be said for this Celita. Its design is so ubiquitous it can easily be maintained by any competent watchmaker affordably the world over. However sadly gone is the unusual crown that folds into the case so charmingly like in the case back of the 214 that you can see in my own vintage space view. This has been exchanged for a conventional non-screw down crown at the three o'clock side that is cleverly tucked away to keep aesthetics faithful and consistent. This is from the PBY Catalina aircraft from World War II. Tom here, I won't say your surname, sir, but uh, he re remembers that I designed a watch in collaboration with NTH, and it was called the Catalina because it was like a hybrid with a very high water resistance. I, I kind of, I was imagining if a pilot throw a Catalina because it's an amphibious plane. So he, he's, he's sending an, an actual piece of a, 
<laughs> the, the aircraft, which is amazing. I'm going to uh, respond to you later on, but Tom, thank you so much. This is, this is going to take pride of place in the war room. I don't know where we are. It's, it's massive, this place. I'm probably going to get lost. I've already got lost once, so... I reviewed these on the channel, the, the, the new Navi timers. Any particular colour you like man, most? Or? Gold. <laughs> are you serious? Well, I guess why not, right? Oh, these are the new Super Oceans. I haven't seen these yet. I keep seeing watches I've reviewed. Yeah. And it's like, oh, hello, old friend. Yeah, they're, they're really coming back now, Zodiac. They're, um, yeah, they're good. I used to be obsessed about Speedmasters. Funny, it's like it, it brings all these memories back. I have like, uh, Einstein used to call it um, choice paralysis. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my God, look at, this, look at that world timer. Can you see that? It's like three dimensional. Unlike previous reissues of the astronaut, so much of the details that make the astronaut so lovably cool are thankfully present or have been logically upgraded. We have multifaceted applied markers that dazzle when you catch the light in different angles. And talking of angles, these horned angular short lugs make it wear so well, even on my modest six and a half inch wrist. The so-called bullet bracelet has wonderfully sloping beveled presidential style high polished links that are contrasted nicely with the brushed finish in the center link. All securely fastened, by a butterfly push-down clasp. There is also just the perfect amount of resistance to the bi-directional monochromatic 24-hour day-night bezel that is slightly offset compared to the equidistantly cut-off Pepsi bezel. This makes it a little bit more quirky and unique, but also more accurate. It frames the double-domed box-shaped sapphire crystal perfectly, giving it very much a UFO shape reminiscent of a Speedmaster and its tachymeter bezel. My favorite feature, however, has to be those refined, retro-futuristic, but very functional handset that is unlike any other, and they all are now gloriously upgraded with modern Superluminova for solid orientation and legibility. I especially love how the markers point outwards, and while it is a shame not to see the Tuning Fork logo, not all, but most of the originals rather interestingly, did not feature them. So they have applied the branding instead to its matte black dial, a subtle but fitting refinement. I was a little trepidatious, a little concerned that it would be too big, the 41 millimeter lug width, but it's measured from the uh, extremities of the bezel and it does overhang. So the case is actually a little smaller, really nice articulation to it. It's extremely comfortable. I love the fit and the feel, so that at least they got absolutely right. Oh, and a strap monster too, another little urban gentry trademark phrase. The re-release of the new astronaut coincided with Bulova's introduction of a smaller lunar pilot for 2023 as well, a move much demanded by the good gentry audience and watch enthusiasts well beyond it. But together they perfectly demonstrate the new dichotomy between these previously conjoined brands. One is now being repositioned as to what Seiko is to Grand Seiko, Acutron being a more luxury brand, with all the new cutting edge tech like the previously reviewed revolutionary electrostatic movements. This is why you will not see the new entry level Miyota 9075 GMT capable caliber that premiered on this channel before anywhere else in the world last year. However, the tried and tested Celita does have all the benefits of the ETA it is a clone of, like hacking 28,800 vibrations an hour, manual wind, independently adjustable GMT hand, along with a power reserve of 56 hours. In terms of performance and accuracy, unfortunately, the website does not state what level it is regulated to. I really wish more brands would do this. And this being a sample 000, I'm not sure if this is going to be a good representation of how most of them will behave. The water resistance is a very capable 100 meters. So recently I opened up my Panerai. I, I was just curious. I wanted to see what they had done to this Valtteri 7750 because of course it originally was a chronograph which they removed that part of the, uh, the movement. And it's beautifully decorated. This is what I think would have elevated the Accutron here. 
little uh, the script they use on the rotor and the bridges and I might even be some beveling I'm not quite sure uh, but it was quite mesmeric and uh, it made me appreciate it much more and recently I bought a vintage poster I chose this image very specifically because it shows the original Italian military divers in World War II wearing the very first Panerai these 47 millimeter monsters. But of course, I get it now with Panerai. They're supposed to be oversized. They were always supposed to be oversized. You know, and a lot of people don't get it. You know, you see people wearing the Santos, the modern Santos. To me, in my opinion, that should be undersized. Panerai should be oversized. It's all to do with, well, obviously your own personal taste, the genre of watch, you know, Fliegers, supposed to be big. You know, Navi timers, supposed to be big. Dress watches, supposed to be small, you know. These are just guidelines, they're not rules. You can break them, do whatever you want, whatever makes you happy at the end of the day. Seeing them period correct sizes of, on these very skinny guys from World War II, these military divers, you know, there's, they're not the muscle bound action stars that I discussed in my review and unboxing. I could totally see myself collecting more and this, this brings us onto a really good point. The Casio, I never thought I'd, I'd like this. The uh, white shadow here, the Universal Genève. Again, this oval shape, I never thought I'd collect. I, I, now I want to buy more, I want to get the golden shadow. The Panerai, I'm weighing for a 40 millimeter submersible. <laughs> I truly am. only three critiques or negatives about the astronaut. Firstly, the ghost position is still there when turning the crown anti-clockwise when it is pulled out to the second GMT setting position. Not a big deal, but it has to be said. Unfortunately, this is not a no-date movement. Secondly, the links are connected by pin and collar, which at this price range is a little bit surprising considering I've seen watches under $500 offering screwed links. And thirdly, while I am sure diehard collectors will snap this up in a second, as there are only 300 being produced, which is an extremely low number for a brand of this scale, at the $3,500 price tag, it will be a bit rich for some. In terms of straps, the Pepsi is on the Oyster uh, bracelet from my Tudor Submariner. They just happen to be compatible. Uh, the Panerai is still on the Riscani uh, Watch Club waffle strap. Um, I have to say, it did feel a bit wrong wearing this with a sports jacket the other day. For more formal, uh, I should have brought a more uh, elegant kind of leather. The Mission Impossible. This is actually from this perforated resin strap. That's from the calculator watch. Again, they just happen to be compatible and far more comfortable, uh, a little bit lighter, just really, really works together. This is FMK. I love the indentations on the back, it really grips the wrist. Extremely solid feeling and the way it sits, a heavy watch like this on the wrist, very reassuring. Uh, this is actually aftermarket, this is not the original strap that the, the uh, forged carbon came on, but it's also from Squirelet. And just to put it into perspective, the same GMT movement can be found in another space-going legendary watch, the Glycine Airman, for under a third of that cost. I think offering a higher decorated grade Solita with a COSC certification would have made the value more justified, and giving you something more to enjoy under that semi-circular display window, which is really cool how they positioned it to show off the balance wheel beating away there. I was thinking actually about the Speedmaster, um, quite fitting for the release of this and also the, the, uh, the smaller Lunar Pilot from Bulova. Bulova, sorry. Finalmente, finalmente. Anyway, yeah, the Speedmaster, that's a watch I was obsessed with. I owned so many different versions and I just fell out of love. I'm more inclined towards buying another Navitimer or uh, Hanhart, all these other great chronograph brands that just really do it for me, you know. And, and I guess with the Panerai and the, the UG here, the Universal Juno, it shows that experience is the ultimate education you, and you have to experience these watches. It's so easy to knock on brands you don't really know or haven't really experienced or don't understand why they are 
the way they are. You know, this gets me more excited, I have to be honest. The Speedmaster is pure class. The attraction faded. It's a bit like that B.B. King song. Uh, I think it's with Tracy Chapman. It just, one day, <laughs> just gone. Have you experienced the same thing? Have you loved the watch, been obsessed by a watch, and then suddenly one day you woke up and the love was gone? So in conclusion, why am I not rushing out to buy this new astronaut myself? Well, in the time between first discovering the brand for myself and collecting Accutron in the early days of the channel, my tastes have changed. It's an inevitable and I think perfectly natural part of the hobby as we experience, learn and are exposed to more watches. As I narrate these words, we are already a quarter into the year and the most worn watch of 2023 so far, believe it or not, is my Panerai. Something I would have never imagined. I had never expected to fall in love with the Cartier Santos last year in 2022 either, but that became one of the most worn watches of my collection for that year. So those two watches I just mentioned cost about the same as a new Accutron. And while I doubt either will increase in value in comparison to the scarcity of the astronaut, it does give you an idea of what else is out there on the market. The high price will undoubtedly be the biggest negative for most. But for those who truly love the distinctive classic design, that's certainly not as mainstream as my Pepsi GMT, it is however just as timeless and arguably even cooler than the GMT Masters Pan Am connection. It's a tale rooted in iconic Cold War era cloak and dagger secrecy, madmen elegance, and all the intrigue that goes along with it. You see, Actron, it's not a timepiece, it's a conversation piece. Naturally, the dream or grail astronaut would have a miniaturized electrostatic movement, but I fear, and I'm only guessing here, we still may be decades away from that. Another alternative would be some kind of higher end or decorated precisionist movement, which in case you didn't know, is Bulova's most accurate. It's 262 kilohertz vibrational frequency is eight times greater than standard quartz, fitting for a spy plane pilot, but also closer to the tuning fork's smooth motion. However, that would have lost the Swiss made label on the dial, along with Accutron, being positioned as Bulova's more upscale luxury sister brand. Here, it's more of a case of damned if you do, damned if you don't. Nonetheless, nobody can deny it's utter pure class, and I would much rather see this than not see it come back at all. So I'm in Indianapolis, as you can tell. We're exploring Indianapolis a bit today. This is White River State Park. We're gonna do a little bit of exploring before I rush to the airport. We have the Indiana State Museum here. There's a really cool steam clock, a functioning steam clock there. Just absolutely astounding. I love the use of space. It's amazing, this canal as well. The watch event was absolutely fantastic and super fun. I only wish there was more time to talk to each person as everyone was all so passionate and so interesting, sharing this thing we all have a love for. Meeting so many of you who have supported the channel by commenting and so on over the years was a true highlight of the evening for me. Hearing the personal stories behind such an eclectic mix of watches, some I never thought I'd even see in the flesh, was just utterly fascinating and enjoyable. Also, it has to be said, the Moya team really is like a family. Their professionalism, kindness, and mutual appreciation for watches is undeniable. Not to mention, they rarely know how to host a great event with plenty of delicious food and even raffles and prizes to win. So a massive thank you to all of them, but also a quick shout out to three fellow YouTubers I got to meet. The one and only Travis at his excellent Trap Vision 3D channel, but also check out D with his insanely cool watches at the ingeniously named Hobby of Ours. Last, but by no means least, our very own horological Hercules of the watch world, Steve Papa. It was an absolute honor to meet all of you. Do check out their channels and show some gentry love, please. The links to all of them will be in the description of this video. I look forward to hopefully returning to Indianapolis as I was planning to visit their world famous racetrack and motorsport museum 
but as there was so much to see downtown, I simply ran out of time. I know, ironic for a guy who reviews watches, but there we go. Also, I did not bring any appropriate racing watches, so maybe a perfect excuse to return in the future. Uh, don't forget to like this video if you want to see more unsponsored, independent, free content like this. Uh, to hit that like button is the best way to support the channel. I'd love to hear from people that haven't really, you know, they, they, they've found their little niche or maybe it's a theme, like maybe it's all pilot watches or all military watches. I'd love to hear from collectors like that that are very focused. I'm kind of jealous of those collectors. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video, all that good stuff. Onwards and upwards and I hopefully I'll catch you back in the war room in Philadelphia. Okay, ciao.